Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. So this is a show I didn't actually want to do. And there's going to be a little redundancy here in the introduction before we get to the conversation. Something really got under my skin a month or so ago. I don't remember exactly when it was. And I see it happen again and again, and I finally figured I'm in sort of a position where I was in the middle of a lot of this stuff to some degree. I am someone who has read all of Steph Young's books. I'm someone who has read all of David Politis's books. I've talked to both of them for long periods of time. I understood how mis- these misunderstandings came to be, and I tried to clarify them as much as I could. And although both Steph and David have not commented about any of this stuff anymore, it's been dropped. There are still people on the internet because once you're on the inter- once something's on the internet, it never really goes away, whether it's true or not or whatever. Um, the stuff just keeps coming up. So I figured I would do this. Originally, it was just going to be a blog post, kind of clearing up everything that actually happened and how the misunderstandings of this stuff came to be. So the thing that got under my skin, well, that was someone on YouTube, you know, and we have some really smart people on YouTube, and they. <laughs> regularly impress me with some of their comments and messages. Um, But of course, it's still YouTube. And on one of Steph's shows, someone had stated that something akin to they could no longer support Steph Young or where did the road go after finding out what Steph did to David. I responded very simply with, Steph never did anything to David. You don't know the whole story. So this guy wrote David. And uh, the message I got from David was that he had been told that I was going to do a scathing expose of a podcast exposing all of David's secrets. I kid you not. This from You Don't Know the Whole Story. Well, here's the whole story. In the next uh, 45 minutes, hour, whatever it is, Joshua and I are going to cover the whole story. There's also a blog post that is linked so you can get some of the links so you can verify these facts yourself. These are verifiable facts. It's very simple to do. There's no bad guy in this story. There's no bad girl in this story. It was simply a matter of the way things looked from different perspectives. And it's perfectly understandable. And it has been, as I said, as far as I know, it has been dropped. But it does pop up now and again on the internet. So this is a... This is not a podcast to expose anyone's secrets. I'm sorry. If you're looking for drama, you need to look elsewhere because hopefully this clears out all that drama and then it can just be left in the past. I know it's not going to work that way. I realize that. Um, But this is the best thing I can do, I think, to clarify some of these issues. There are three main points that we're going to go over here. Uh, The first one was the allegations that Steph was copying David. Um, And as David said to me, uh, this this was something people were telling him. And uh, I I showed him, or I talked to him, when I talked to him, I I went over the list of stuff that Steph and I had talked about from her previous book. And he responded with, well, that, that doesn't sound anything like what I cover, because Steph's covering paranormal stuff. She's covering conspiracies. She's covering just really out there stuff. She's a collector of stories. She does do research, but sometimes they're anti- anecdotal, sto- <laughs> yeah, anecdotal stories of uh, you know from people she's talked to, or they have uh, contacted her with a story. There's one first chapter of one of her books goes on to this whole alternate dimension story, which is really fascinating. I don't know if it's true or not. I tend to be a little skeptical of it, but uh, it was nonetheless quite interesting and nothing at all like something David Politis would write about. David was very, uh, is very clear on what he writes about, and uh, it's very specific. It's not just missing people. 
So that was the first issue. It was people telling David she was copying him. And David honestly didn't understand if she wasn't copying him, why people were telling him this. And that's a great question. It really is. And uh, I'll use the term, these people were clearly cognitively impaired. And they heard missing people and thought, oh, David does missing people. She must be copying him. All right. We'll get into detail on that. The second thing was the uh, release of her book, Dead in the Water, which deals with drowning deaths. At this point, it did look like she was sort of, as David put it, riding her, his coattails. I mean, he had released a sobering coincidence uh, months earlier, and then she released this. What David did not know, and had no reason to know because he has not read Steph's books, is that Steph had been writing about these cases long before he published his book. Not only that, but on this very show, months before he put out a sobering coincidence, she said she was releasing a book on all these cases. It happens. I mean, stuff overlaps. There are already books out on these cases. They were called the smiley face killers. Um, this was not uh, stuff no one else had covered. It's not like David discovered it and no one else could write about it. It does, doesn't work like that. Um, but David, understandably, was upset. It looked like she had just suddenly jumped on this uh, bandwagon and was riding his coattails and, uh, because he didn't know. He had no reason to know. And the third thing was an incident with the Facebook forum, which, if it wasn't for the first two things, wouldn't even have mattered. Uh, in the end, after they exchanged sort of a heated uh, email exchange, they, uh, she removed herself from the forum. He removed all his posts about her. And that was the end of it. It was done. And that's where it should stay. So, let, so please, you know, listen to what we're talking about here. This is unnecessary drama. The focus should be on cases. The focus should be on what David has discovered, the, uh, the, the quieting of these cases from the national parks where, you know, they don't keep track of them. Why is that? Um, is it just publicity or is it something else? David has done a lot of really important work here, tracing some of these cases. Um, Steph, Steph is more like uh, someone who collects folklore, but she's also dealt in depth with these drowning cases and stuff and has very different conclusions than David does. Um, and that's deeply disturbing on either, on either interpretation. So, all right. Reluctantly, here is uh, Joshua Cutchin helping me out with this uh, podcast, detailing all of this stuff. And like I said, you can check the, uh, the blog that will be linked to this for links to all kinds of different stuff related to this. If you find that I have a fact wrong, let me emphasize fact, please correct me. Um, if it's just that you don't feel you like something in here, well, you know, that's your problem. But if, you can, if, if there's a fact I got wrong, please correct me on it and I will update things. All right. Uh, this is a different sort of episode of where did the road go i'm joined uh with josh by joshua cutchin hello josh hi sir how's it going and this is a show i didn't really want to do but um this subject keeps coming up repeatedly and i figured let's get all the information out there get the facts out there and then people can do with it what they want they can double check the facts they can they can make up their own minds once they have all the information and this revolves around um, the, I'm not even sure what you would want to call it, the, the disagreements between Steph Young and David Politis. I don't even know how to phrase it better than that. I think it's probably the most concise way to do it. Um, so for people who don't know who David Politis is, uh, David originally was a Bigfoot researcher and started a series of books called Missing 411. And they have become very, very popular. I know I was pretty blown away the first time I heard him on Coast to Coast. He, uh, you know, he has something really interesting there. And he's done, let's see, how many books now? Five, six? Um, yeah, it, it sounds at least. That sounds, it sounds about right. Six, six, and they just released the movie recently. Yeah, yeah so, which I haven't seen yet, and I do want to see so David started post, uh, publishing his Missing 411 books back in, uh, in 2012 and uh, published two, the first two, Eastern and Western, right away. 
we had him on the show, oh, I want to say in the first year, 2013. Uh, it, was one of the, it was one of the few two-hour shows I did with him. Um, I didn't do a lot of two-hour shows, period. And I think the only other two-hour one I had done up to that point was with uh, Robert Schock. <clears throat> but there was so much interesting stuff in, in what David had discovered. Um, now, mind you, here, here's one of the things that caused some of these issues, is that there are a lot of people who seem to think that David discovered the subject of missing people. And right, I mean, if you, if you look back, I mean... Uh, uh, that you still find old fate magazine articles from like the sixties sort of discussing certain trends in cluster areas. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and there's like, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, strange disappearances from Brad Steiger that talks about a lot of the stuff that both Steph and David Politis talk about. And, yeah. uh, I mean, people have been writing about missing people for a very long time and it, David has definitely popped it into more of a pop culture sort of uh, view. Uh, a lot more people are aware of some of these weird disappearances that weren't before. But like, for instance, a lot of the books, a lot of the cases in David's books can be found on the Missing Persons of America website or the Charlie Project website, both which predate David's books uh, by at least, well, Missing Persons of America by at least a year and the Charlie Project dates back to 20, 2004. Most, you know, I mean, David's not going out and finding brand new cases that no one's ever heard of. He does in some cases, but there's enough of them out there that other people, especially the older ones, other people have written about them before. Obviously, Dennis Martin has been written about extensively before. Uh, what David did that was different is he actually went and talked to the dad, and no one had done that. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I think what he did was he he definitely like shone a light on the. I don't want to say the cover up, but like the aspects of it that did seem to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more conspiratorial, which I think has some legs. Yes. Oh, so do I. I, I think if nothing else, the national park service does not want people to realize how many people go missing every year. Yeah. And that's something that nobody had touched on before. No, no. And, uh, apparently that's how he got into it. He said a couple of park rangers that came and talked to him while he was uh, researching Bigfoot stuff. Right. <clears throat> and they said, you know, Look, there's strange disappearances, and no one wants to talk about them. They're just kind of lost in the, you know, all the paperwork and so on and so forth. So not, not only that, though, he also started working out these patterns. These, you know, uh, people are found in locations that have been previously searched numerous times. It's oftentimes the last in line or the first in line that disappears. Um, berry picking is a common thing. You know, people disappear often while berry picking. Uh, there, there's, there's all these things like the, the lack of clothes, lack of, you know, when they are yeah. found, they don't have a memory of where they've and been. They're, right. They're found face down. Bow hunters disappear more often. Yeah. There are a bunch of different, a uh, bunch of different rubrics that he outlined. And so that, that is what David has brought to this game. And it's a very important piece of this puzzle. Um, whether all of those pieces actually end up meaning something or not, who knows? Um, we may never totally know, but that is what David has brought in. And when David looks at cases, David will look at very specific types of cases that fit these criteria. There are certain criteria he's looking for. Now, Steph Young started publishing books. Let's see. I want to say uh, 2014. She, I, th I think she had published before that, actually. 2012, she started writing books. Okay. Uh, and she was writing on angels and near-death experiences <clears throat> and stuff like that. Well, she, partially inspired by David, as well as other people, she started looking at some of these darker stories. And she started writing some of these books that were talking about weird disappearances in the woods and, you know, all this dark stuff that was happening. But unlike David, she wasn't looking for patterns. She was just collecting stories, and not all of them have to do in the woods. You pick up one of her books, it goes all over the place. That was just kind of a thematic sort of thing. She also started publishing under the name Steph Young, or Stephen Young, I'm sorry. Right. Because she didn't think anyone was going to take her seriously as a woman. And right. that, that may sound ridiculous to people, but it is totally a thing. Oh, it's 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 totally a thing, especially I think I think there are some um I think that there are some 
aspects of unexplained research that are better about it than others. Like I think that I think that that's I think that it's almost an even playing field in like ghost research. Yeah. But in ufology, in ufology and Bigfoot study, or you know, even cryptozoology, it's definitely a thing. And there's there's no, I mean, there's plenty of people who write under pen names. So you know, people have thought, well, that's weird. Why isn't she writing under her own name? Well, that's why. And she never planned on doing interviews or promoting her <sighs> yeah. stuff at all. Well, especially if if, you, if you're not sure if this, if you're not sure if writing about Fortiana is going to take off, it's kind of advisable to do that. Like I thought about doing that because. What happens is your name gets out there attached to something that, you know, let's face it, folks, you know, most of most of the world out there views as, you know, crazy people stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you don't want that labeled under your real name in many cases. Uh, plus, when you're a woman, too, you want to kind of, I would think, protect your identity a little bit. Uh, also, also true. Because there are some very creepy people out there who get obsessed. Um, and if actually her first book on this stuff was in early 2014, it was mysterious things in the woods. Yeah. Um, and if you look on any of her interviews on where the road go on the YouTube, you can see some of the creepy comments people have left about her. Um, so if you wonder why she's not writing under her real name, that's a part of it as well. Uh, she changed it to Steph young recently, I think officially on Amazon because, uh, that's, you know, she's been on so many shows and stuff at this point, it's just confusing to have it under Steven. Uh, but she was she was actually contacted by Coast to Coast to go on. And that was the first time anyone really heard of her. It's like, I think they were looking for more stuff like David Politis's work. And they, they saw her books and asked her to come on. And then they were thoroughly confused that, it, that she was a she and not a he. And uh, I had a bunch of people refer me to that interview and say, oh, you should talk to this woman. She, she has some really interesting stuff. So I contacted her. She was already a fan of the show, which was awesome. And uh, I had her on, I don't know, 2014 maybe? Somewhere in there. Um, you can check all this stuff if you go through the web, Road Go page. But the thing is, and here's, here's where a lot of this stuff gets confused with people. Steph does not write about the stuff David Politis writes about. I, uh, at some point was talking to David and he asked why I had her on if she was just covering the same stuff he was. And I gave him the list of everything Steph and I talked about on the previous show. And he went quiet for a minute went, that doesn't sound like anything I, I talk about. I'm like, I know it's completely different stuff. I think people, and I know this actually, that there are a lot of people out there who think David just covers missing people. Whereas in reality, David is covering missing people primarily in, in and around national parks that fit a specific criteria. With Steph, she covers dark-eyed kids or black-eyed children. She covers UFOs. She covers anything she feels like covering: time travel, conspiracies, alternate realities. All this type of stuff gets thrown into her books. It's nothing like what David Politis does. It's actually more like what Brad Steiger used to do, where he would write short books on just kind of grab a subject and throw a bunch of stuff he researched onto it and then move on to another book. And I would argue that both serve very important functions. Absolutely. You know, that, uh, that doing this in a very, uh, you know, uh, level headed, sober minded way is, is extremely important, especially for the legitimacy of it. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I think that the fact that Steph is, is fine with, uh, speculating is, uh, is, 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 is you know, it's, it's, that's another thing that like we all kind of want to hear too. Yes. Yes. And David specifically does not speculate. You know, he, right. He, right. he, he will not go out there and tell you what he thinks it is, even if he does have something in his head. And I think initially he did think it was Bigfoot. Um, and I can understand that, especially after my last show with Timothy Renner on his Bigfoot book, I can see some of the, the very distinct similarities between Bigfoot encounters and some of these missing 411 cases. Some of the books, uh, the encounters in his book could be in the missing 411 books. So right. I could totally understand David coming from that perspective to begin with, thinking maybe it was Bigfoot. But I think at a certain point he realized the Bigfoot explanation wasn't holding water. There were, these were too strange in some cases. And I'm sure, you know, if we, if we could somehow figure out what happened in every one of these cases, I would say probably more than 50% of them are going to have prosaic explanations that they just look weird on paper. Yeah. Nonetheless, they do look weird on paper, and some of them are going to end up puzzling. You know, I mean, there's, there's no easy way to explain some of these things. 
Now, um, what happened, what started all of this, is there were people telling David that she was copying him. And David had no idea who she was. You know, this was some unknown woman that suddenly he's being told is, is copying his work when she wasn't. And I, I'm going to label these people the cognitively impaired people. These are the same people when I have David on and we go on and on at the beginning of the show about how you shouldn't buy his books on Amazon. And the first comment they leave is, oh, they're too expensive on Amazon. I can't buy these. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I don't know what sort of a person gets to that point and goes, oh, well, I guess I'm going to stop looking. They're too expensive. Like, keep on looking. It doesn't occur to you that maybe <laughs> there might be somewhere else. Not only that, either you weren't paying attention to the interview or B, you didn't even listen to the interview and you just left a comment. Yeah, I think he maybe says it on every single every single interview that I've heard that comes up. And, and I've made a big point of it because they are so expensive on Amazon. I mean... I think he should put them on Amazon. I think he should put them out as eBooks and, and whatever format, because I'm the type of person that believes the more formats things are available in the better, but it's his work. He can do what he wants. If he doesn't want to put it on Amazon, he doesn't have to put it on Amazon. But the problem with that is that other people are going to put it on Amazon and they're going to charge more for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's tried and he can't, I don't think he can take them down, but he tries to kind of, rel, you know, check when people order like, a bunch of books. He'll be like, why are you ordering a bunch of books? You know, and things like that, which, you know, can also go wrong in certain situations. The, uh, so let's see. So they, they were both writing about this stuff. She came into his radar and then I had that conversation with him because, you know, people were, po you know, pointing him to the interview she did on my show. And I went down the stuff that Steph and I had talked about and he realized that's not even remotely the type of stuff he's covering. And I think at that point he kind of dropped it. I think it was in the back of his head as it would be because he, I don't think ever looked at her books or listened to her interviews. I think he just didn't have the time for it and didn't care. It was just kind of a minor little, you know, thorn in his side. Like who is this woman and why do people keep telling me she's copying me? And then he released in July of 2015, missing 411, a sobering coincidence. And basically, this is looking at urban disappearances, uh, particularly the ones that have previously been named the Smiley Face Killers. Now, there have been a number of books written about the Smiley Face Killers. What David did with his book is try to compare it to these wilderness disappearances. Um, right. And he makes a good case, but all in all, I don't think they're connected. I think you're looking at two different phenomena. I think the urban disappearances are probably people doing it that, that, I, I, that's I, a little bit that, that's exactly what i was going to say is that they don't have that i mean they, they do have i don't want to say that they don't have that sort of high strange quality but it's high less strange i guess is, is, yeah, is a better yeah. way to put it and and like there were there are cases like elisa lamb where there was a lot of misinformation out there um and it looks less i mean it's still a weird case it's you know no matter what happened it's a weird case but it's less weird when you've, you know, as more information comes out, it looks less and less weird. I mean, I don't know. So it's like that looks, you know, when, the way David presents it in the book makes it look almost supernatural. Now it doesn't so much look supernatural. It looks like something bad happened to this girl, and it wasn't necessarily of a supernatural character. Right. I mean, I did a whole show with John Lordan about, or Lorden about that, and, uh, you know, again, though, it's a matter of how much information you can get about any one of these things. Um, so that was that was in July of 2015. In March of 2016, Steph published a book called Dead in the Water, Forever Awake, Investigating the Smiley Face Killers. Similar cases, because they're both the smiley face killers. And, of course, people started writing David and saying, look, she's copying you. You put out the book, and then she put out the book. And David got upset, as he, you know, which is totally reasonable. The problem is, Steph was writing about all these cases in previous books. And when she was on my show in uh, 2015, she said, I'm actually going to write a book collecting all these dead in the water cases in one place. So from David's perspective, she had written a book just like he did and put it out after him. But when you actually look at all the information, you find that she had been writing about all these cases previously in previous books. 
and had declared her intent to write this book publicly before David wrote his book and before anyone knew David was even looking at this stuff because David had said repeatedly he was never going to look at urban disappearances. Right. So from David's viewpoint, David put up a timeline of when he released his books and when she released her books to prove that he had published, you know, the, the stuff before her, not realizing that these cases took up a chapter in every one of those previous books that were out before his, uh, his book, which was the uh, Sobering Coincidence book. Right. So from, from his vis- viewpoint, she was copying him, and here was more evidence. So now, now this little thorn in the side seemed like a bigger deal. Um, and I had talked to him about it, and I actually sent him a list of all the cases she covered, and she covered quite a few more than he did, actually, over the course of her, her writings, which ones appeared in which books, and et cetera, et cetera. And I pointed him to the interview she did where she said she was going to write this book before he ever published his book. So this, this is point of view type of uh, misunderstanding here. You know, he has, it's totally understandable why he would think she was copying him. But when you look at the actual facts, she was writing about the stuff first. And she said she was writing the book long before he put his book out. Right. And, uh, you know, to another point, um, even if 49% of the cases were the same, I mean, the only way that progress is made in any field is by building off of existing literature. I mean that in the sciences. I mean that in Fortiana. I mean that in anything where the, where there's sort of an expected progression, you reference other people's work. You know, yeah. I, I and if, if as long as she referenced his work, um, even even if there was you know some sort of time frame discrepancy, as long as she was referencing his work. She, and she's writing about something completely different. If she's speculating on what happened as opposed to, you know, just presenting the facts as he did, then it's, it's sort of a non-issue. I mean, you know, I, I, if you were, well, if you were, if you were to separate, if you were to take one of my books and to take out all the stuff that was referencing other people's work, you'd wind up with like 20 pages <laughs> because that's just the way this works, folks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, I think most people understand that. And, and the case of, of these two, books both of them were referring to earlier works written about the smiley face killers so steph wasn't referencing any of david's work she was referencing the same stuff that david was using as reference for his book right right the difference is she was she was also including cases like the manchester well i think it was called the manchester pusher where someone suspected someone was pushing these kids into the canals in in manchester in england um Mm -hmm. that's that like that stuff's not in david's books David actually wrote me about it afterwards saying, oh, you know, I found this, which is very similar to what's going on in, you know, in the U.S. But, of course, Steph being in the U.K., that was more prominent for her. Right. So it wasn't a matter of either one of them copying each other. It was just the the way the stuff worked out. But, again, if David already has in the back of his mind she's copying me and then she puts this book out after he puts his book out, it definitely strengthens that point of view, even if the point of view is not correct. Excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> Took the words out of um, my mouth. At this point, you know, again, I sent him the list of where she wrote about all this stuff to show him, to prove to him, look, you can go check. And I don't think he really did. I, I suspect he, he believed me when I sent him the list, but it still bugged him. And, uh, you know, David's pretty focused on his work. David doesn't seem to be someone who goes through a lot of other people's stuff. I think he's very focused on what he's doing. Right. And I imagine this takes up an enormous amount of time. So again, he probably didn't feel like it was worth his trouble to go buy her books, read through them. And I, and I don't know how tech savvy David is. Um, the fact that he doesn't put out his stuff as eBooks um, suggests to me also that he probably doesn't read them very often. It it, it does. I, I also have some friends who have expressed some security concerns over ebooks, so that might factor into it as well. Which you know, oh, so, I understand. I mean, as you know, prints dying anyway, so it makes me kind of sad when I don't see. You know, I, I kind of am, am sympathetic to that. But yes, that that could be that could be a possibility. Yeah. Um. So you know. It, it's like, is she hurting me? No, it's annoying me. Yes. I'm not going to go read through her books to find this, you know, to see what's actually going on. Um, and it just kind of dropped at that point. 
And the the thing that really upset him and brought a lot of this stuff into more of a public notice prior to this is there was a missing 411 group on Facebook. Now, initially, David was an admin of that group and had given them the blessing to use the missing 411 name. And the stories differ greatly as to exactly what happened. David's version is that the... uh, the, the he was correcting people on the missing 411 information in the group and someone got upset about it and removed him as admin and kicked him out of the group i've heard different things from people who were in the group saying that he was being rude to people and so on and so forth i don't know what's true i didn't see any of this i have no idea what happened all i can say for sure is that david was kicked out of the group that bared the missing 411 name So after they did this, one of the admins approached Steph and asked Steph if she wanted to become a part of this group and that they were going to change the name. Steph said no, apparently. Uh, Steph, for anyone who follows her, it should be plainly obvious, Steph does not spend a lot of time on Facebook. Steph does not like technology. Steph does not own a smartphone. Um, She doesn't want, what Steph wants to do is write books. That is, that is what she got into this for. That is what she likes doing. She likes researching stuff and writing books. Um, she did not want to be part of a forum. And they, they told her, you don't have to do anything. If you want, you can. But if you don't, you know, we would just like to have you in there. You can, you know, drop messages when you have new books out and stuff like that. And she said, okay. And apparently nothing happened for a while. And then they added her as an admin to the group, and someone, you know, wrote a message tagging her and thanking her, you know, for for being part of the group, and she thanked them for welcoming her in. And uh, then she popped up a thing about one of her books because it was free on Amazon at the time. She's like, oh, if you haven't read my stuff, you can check it out here. Here was the problem, though. The group was still the Missing 411 Forum. They had never changed the name. So... Here's a group that David was kicked out of that now Steph was promoting her books in that bared his name. Yeah, and that's that I think that he should be able I think that he I mean, I'm surprised that he hasn't has he copyrighted that he certainly has copyrighted missing four one one by this point, right? I I don't know. Can he? I mean, because it's it's kind of I don't know if it's an easy to copyright term. Well, you know, I mean like four one one used to be what directory assistance, right? So I would Yeah, I think I I think it means missing information. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, how did, if it existed beforehand, then maybe he can't. But uh, I, I dare say that he should have creative control over anything t- in this field um, titled "Missing 411." If not, for, yes. if not from a legal standpoint, then just from like you know, just a, a, a decency standpoint, an ethical standpoint, he should have control over that. He totally should. Right, because his name is pretty much. If you hear the phrase "Missing 411," you think David Politis. Right. And so that, that was kind of Steph's, Steph's misstep there by posting before they changed the name. And they did change the name very shortly afterwards. Um, but she had, when she saw the uproar and how upset David was about it, um, she removed herself from the group. She apologized. Um, but then David's legions of fans started attacking her and leaving her one-star reviews on Amazon, even though they hadn't read the books, accusing her of plagiarism and all this other stuff. In the end, this, the two of them worked this out. David removed his posts about her. Steph, you know, said, uh, you know, basically they agreed to leave each other alone, from what I understand, which is how it should be, really. Uh, a bunch of people have said, oh, you should have them both on a show together. I can guarantee you that will never happen. But here's the other thing about Steph posting in that forum. If it had been anyone but Steph doing the exact same thing, David wouldn't have noticed or cared. The only reason David cared or noticed is because here was Steph Young popping up again, even though the things that, you know, had gotten under his skin before turned out not to be legit. Now she was posting in a missing 411 forum. Right. But if you went into that forum and posted about your books, he wouldn't have been upset about it. If, you know, someone else writing about missing people posted, he wouldn't have cared. It's the fact that it was Steph Young who did it. Which, I mean, you know, I, I actually, you know, I, I totally understand. I think it's, I think 
you know, I don't think there was any any malice on anyone's part. It was just sort of the way that no. things came together. But uh, yeah, I, I totally get why that would be, you know, they'll put a bee in your bonnet, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And so the thing is, people keep bringing this stuff up, and that's why I did this show. That that is the basic story. I'm going to put up a blog linking to all the stuff, so you can see all the stuff that exists online anyway. So you can see everything as it played out. You can look, you can check out Steph's books. I've read all of David's books and all of Steph's books. I can absolutely guarantee that Steph is not in any way, shape, or form copying David in any aspect. Um, the only place where their stuff overlaps is in the uh, drowning cases, which aren't really drowning cases. And with those, there is, they are both drawing from other sources, and they both cite those other sources, and they're the same sources, because neither of them are the first people to write about this stuff. Not to mention neither of them are the first person to write about weird things in the woods or missing people or any of that stuff. Um, it's just what's happened with David, I think, is that David's popularity is so big that he, you know, not, and it's not that anything David's done wrong. It's that he has this, this sort of pop culture support. And so that he gets propped up as being the, the, the person who came up with all this stuff. And whereas, yes, as we said, he came up with certain things. A lot of people don't seem to understand that's the case. They they actually seem to think he's like the first person to write about missing people. Right. And uh, if I could if I could sort of speak um, to something that has has really bothered me in a pretty profound way, um, mm-hmm. and this has nothing to do with David and everything to do with some some rabid followers. There is nothing in my mind more intellectually dishonest than to hear that, so, than to just take on face value that someone has plagiarized someone else's work and then to go over to their Amazon page and slap a one star review on their book saying, This is plagiarism. If, unless you have purchased that product, unless you have used that service in the case of something like Yelp, you have zero right to do that. Zero right. And, and I will take a firm stance on that every single time. Not David's problem. It's the problem of some people who have who have heard these things and have, who have made assumptions and have gone over and basically impacted someone else's livelihood without actually having purchased the product. That is the height of dishonesty, yeah. and I will never, ever, ever stand for that. Nor will I stand for accusations of plagiarism when there's no, there's no actual foundation for it, because that is an extremely serious accusation for anyone who is a writer to to face. Yes. Yeah. Um. And I don't know that David ever accused Steph of plagiarism. I don't think he ever did. Right. In conversations with me, he always said she was copying what I'm doing. Well, and, and, and to be clear, I never said that he did, but his, yeah. there have been some people who have. Yes. Um, oh yeah. Some, some, you know, some, some, some fans and such. And that's just it, that it makes me physically ill to hear about that. There was a comment left on one of Steph's interviews on YouTube with this show where the woman said, oh, this woman can't even speak, and she's plagiarizing David Politis' work word for word. And I read that, and of course, nothing in the interview was anything that David's ever even remotely covered. And so instead of deleting it, I responded and said, great, really? She's plagiarizing David Politis. Could you please show me where in David's books David has written about any of this stuff or even talked about it in interviews? And of course, there was no response because he hadn't, and she had no idea what she was talking about. She was just a you know a huge fan of David Politis and thought she was doing him a favor by attacking Steph Young. Right. Right. You know, it's it's sort of a syncophantic sort of uh, behavior, and it's unfortunate that some people behave like that. They don't think for themselves. They don't say, "Oh, she's copying him." Well, let me take a look at her books and see, or listen to the interview. Instead, they just spew this nonsense and these are the people i consider cognitively impaired well and 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 they're the uh and they're the they're the real offenders here in my opinion yes yeah and they're the ones who started it because david said numerous people had said she's copying me okay so david's not saying that david's trying to understand what's going on and probably like i said either didn't have the, the didn't care enough to pick up her books or didn't want to buy, you know, a bunch of ebooks and didn't want to support somebody who may have been copying him. Who who knows what reason he had, but I'm I'm fairly certain he's never read the any of her stuff. Um the most recent incident with this that I can remember, uh on one of Steph's shows, someone had commented that he really liked Steph Young, but he could no longer listen to her after finding out what she did to David. 
And so I, you know, I said to him, look, I don't think you know what you're talking about. And we went back and forth a little bit. And apparently he then wrote David. And I'm not entirely sure what David said to him, but he came up with some old archive post somewhere on the web that listed the timeline of when he, David released stuff and when Steph released stuff that we talked about earlier. And he posted that and I was like, okay. And then David contacted me and he said, somebody just wrote me and told me you're going to do a show exposing all my secrets. <laughs> okay. And I, I read, I read that and went, it's gotta be this guy because this is the only person I have interacted with involving, you know, David Politis. I wrote David back and I said, what secrets do those be Dave? <laughs> like, I have no idea what, you, you know, what this person is talking about. And I told him I was going to do a blog post and possibly, you know, a thing on this, just getting some of the facts out, and, you know, and he said, okay, all right, thanks for the support and all, you know, and I was just like, but I'm, I'm going, okay. So I told the guy he doesn't have all the information and he somehow twisted that into, I'm going to do a show exposing all of David Politis' secrets. I, I don't have any, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know what I would expose. I mean, David and I, I mean, sure, there were times we talked off air and that stuff, you know, not being on air would never be, you know, publicly put out there by me because I don't do things like that. And unless I had to defend myself in some way, I would never post anything like that. Um, but there's really nothing that where, you know, I could say, oh, David, David did all these horrible things. No, there's, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing I have. All I meant by you don't know the full story is that things didn't happen the way some people out there in the internet think things happened. Right. This came down to a misunderstanding. It definitely look it's understandable why it looked the way it did to David. Yeah. But it wasn't the case. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's the, I mean, it's, it's sort of the fake news problem writ large, you know, people yeah, yeah. hear something and they run with it. I suppose actually doing the legwork themselves. Well, not, not only that, but whoever's the most popular gets the credit, you know, and, and that's not because of the people themselves, but it's the, the fans that tend to do this. Like, um, if you look up Metallica's enter Sandman and you look up Excel's tapping into the emotional void, Metallica took that almost note from note from Excel. It's one of their biggest songs and they didn't even really write it. Now I'm not saying that Metallica said, let's copy this Excel song. They were fans of Excel. They probably didn't realize they did it. But there are videos up that compare the two songs side by side, and it's frightening how exact those songs are musically. Uh, there are cases with Led Zeppelin. Uh, what, what song is it with Led Zeppelin? Do you know? Is it, is it Stairway to Heaven that they're being uh, yeah, the, uh, sued over? Yeah, every now, and then, every now and then Stairway to Heaven crops up as something that uh, is supposedly you know, plagiarized um, someone else. I'm... You know, it's kind of funny. You'd think being a um, being a musician, I'd be a little bit more sensitive to you know accusations of plagiarism in in music, but that's not it's not really the case uh, for me that much. I, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to people having things that are similar, you know, melodically, because if the feel is different, if the groove is different, if you know, sort of instrumentation is different, I feel like it sort of mitigates a lot of that. Um, because at the end of the day, you only have 12 tones to work with. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. And that's true. And like Excel never sued Metallica over it or anything. Right. But if you, if you ask anyone, you said, oh, this song sounds just like an Excel song. People are going to assume, well, Excel copied Metallica because Metall Metallica, the bigger band. Right. I mean, I, and I, it, I don't think that the best ideas are generated in a vacuum. Um, yeah. And I don't yeah. think that the best ideas, I mean, I think that... <laughs> Sort of like the emergence of agriculture all across the planet, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. It kind of all happened at once. It was agriculture time. <laughs> right, right. Or it was information passed down. Right. <laughs> to, to, to get um, off track. It's not complete unless we try to find where the road went. <laughs> um, so that's that's basically the story. And I know, like, recently he had, uh, David had posted, uh, we had Thomas Spriggs on who, is using David's work and he's using it properly. He cites it. He uses it under fair use to kind of expand on what David did and look for other patterns based on David's work. 
Now, that is not plagiarism. That is exactly how you're supposed to do this type of stuff. Um, and David had not, again, I don't think David had looked into it. Someone said something to him and he posted to his page, is this guy plagiarizing me? Now, he didn't say, hey, this guy's plagiarizing me. He asked people if they had read the book and if he was, you know, plagiarizing his work. And it immediately generated one-star reviews for Thomas Spriggs. Yeah. Yeah. That was another one that, that sort of, that, that bothered me. Yeah. And that wasn't because David told them to do that or anything of that sort. No. It's people taking it upon themselves, you know, to come to the rescue of their hero, which is not necessarily what he ever asked to be in the first place. Right. You know, there was a point where talking off the air with David, he had asked me who the most famous person I ever interviewed was. And, you know, I had to think about it. I'm like, I don't know. And, and, I, and I thought about it and I said, probably you, because his stuff is so big at this point. And I don't think he even necessarily realizes how big it is. Right. In comparison to so much other stuff out there. And he just kind of laughed. He's like, no, no, seriously. And I'm like, no, I think you might be it. You know, I mean, short of that, maybe John Anthony West or Robert Schock or someone like that. But uh, David's popularity is through the roof, and that, of course, also, uh, with, with the plenty of intelligent people who are following this, also brings in a lot of, as, as I've called them, uh, comp comprehension-impaired people. Uh, David has said he gets tons of missing cases reports that have nothing to do with what he's doing. You know, people will just send him every missing person report, and he's like, oh, well, that's not really what I'm doing. So he just kind of, you know, it's, it's just more stuff for him to go through in a sense. Right. It's not necessarily helpful if people don't understand the patterns that he's looking into. And like I said, Thomas Spriggs is not, Thomas Spriggs is doing what anyone should do with this type of stuff. He took, you know, that as a baseline, you know, his, his work is, uh, David's work is a baseline. He credited it appropriately. He didn't quote it extensively. And he started saying, look, there are these patterns that pop up in these clusters that no one has looked at yet. And he right. added a bunch of cases of his own. I mean, his book is not so much a book on missing people as it is analyzing these clusters and the way the, the patterns play out. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, that's, there, was, there was something else I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah, and... Uh, David Politis' latest book on hunters, the, uh, the last chapter he has on there, is about a bow hunter who sees something moving through the woods, and I forget her name, um, but she sees something moving through the woods beneath her that looks almost like the predator, you know, where it's like, like it's, it's some kind of cloaking device. Or like a heat shimmer sort of appearance, yeah. Yeah, and she had never even seen the movie Predator, apparently. Um, you know, he kind of throws that out there in his latest book as a, you know, look at this story. Steph Young wrote about that story in one of her first books. And the problem here is that Steph said to me, I don't know if I can talk about this story anymore now that David's written about it because everyone's going to think I'm copying him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where the popularity problem comes in. You know, people are familiar with David. They're not as familiar with Steph. And so they don't know that she came, you know, she came across that story first. David's not copying her in any way, but when you look at it, you could almost make more, like if you had to make a legal argument that one copied the other, there's more evidence that David's copying Steph than the other way around. Yeah, and that's, that's not the case, you know? No, it is definitely not the case. Let me be very clear about that. He is not copying <laughs> Steph in any way. It's just that Steph has come across these stories before David has and written about them first. And right. David has come across them independently and also written about them because that happens. I mean, yeah. It, it, look at Roswell. If if Stanton Friedman said nobody else can write about Roswell now that I put my book out, you know, wh how would that yeah. have gone? <laughs> doesn't doesn't work like that, you know. <laughs> and and you know, Stan is probably one of the most informed people about Roswell and he's probably your go-to person. If you want, if you want to learn about Roswell, just like with, uh, you know, with Peter Robbins and Rendlesham, if you want to learn about Rendlesham, you talk to Peter. Um, and if you want to know about missing people, you know, from like the, the probably the most authoritative source, you, you talk to David, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been people who have written books about area 51 or rather Roswell or Rendlesham or missing people that don't have something very valid and very worthwhile to add to the conversation or a very, a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, there was something else I was going to say right here, and, and I've lost it. Hmm. What was it, Josh? 
I have no idea. I wasn't in your brain, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. All right. Um, well, I mean, that, that, that is the basic idea of what I wanted to get out. Like I said, I didn't really want to do this show. I kind of wanted to let it die, but it's very obvious it's not going to die. It keeps popping up, and it keeps popping up on my damn YouTube, uh, especially. Oh, yeah? So, for people who don't know the full story, now you do. This, yeah. this was not a matter of Steph doing anything to David. Steph did not copy David. She did not plagiarize David. If you don't believe me, accompanying this will be a link to a blog that has all the books, where this stuff was printed, uh, the interview where Steph, you know, proclaims that she was writing this book, uh, the links to the sites that covered some of the cases David uh, covers in his first books that covered them before he did. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like it's ridiculous that some people need to, to be told that not only one person can write about missing people. Yeah, it's, it, it is a bit mind boggling. You know, it's like <laughs> how many, you know, how many diet books can there be? You're, you're, how can you write about losing weight? This other person's written about losing weight. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, and I had said to David at some point, I said, you know, if I ever felt that, that Steph was plagiarizing you, I would never have her on the show again. And David said to me, he's like, I wouldn't want you to do that. And I said, no, if she was, a if I felt that she was actually copying you in any way, I would not have her back. You know, I'm like, it's not the case. And the other, the other thing too, is that, that David's reached this level of popularity because he is so well-spoken. He is so charismatic. He, you know, I mean, he's just incredibly pleasant to listen to. His stuff is very well thought out. He prepares for his interviews uh, he doesn't do wild speculation and that, you know, that reward is that he has become a very popular person in these fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I'm, <laughs> I'm eager to see how many people make it halfway through this show or don't listen to it and go ahead and comment on, <laughs> on yes, YouTube. Yes. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. How, how, how many cognitively impaired people just uh, totally take what we said out of context. So, the the, yeah. the the basic sum up again, Steph Young never copied David Politis. David had every reason to think she was based on what people was tell were telling him, but there is evidence to the contrary. David was mistaken from but from an understandable viewpoint, and the only misstep Steph had was posting in the missing four one one forum before they changed their name. Uh, she admitted that misstep and removed herself from the group and apologized. So. If it had been anyone else, as I said, it wouldn't even have mattered that that happened. It was the fact that it was Steph Young based on stuff that wasn't actually a thing. Right. And now she's not part of the group. The group has changed the name. They have both, you know, David has removed all his, all the stuff on his page about her. She's leaving him alone. And it would be really awesome if everyone else would just drop it too. I know, yeah, I, I, I know it's the internet. I that. I know it's the internet and people love drama, but there's no drama here. There's no secrets. There's nothing to expose. It's as simple as that. Two people are writing about very different stuff. Yes, they crossed a little bit in one section and then went different ways afterwards. That happens. It's not a great, it's not a huge swimming pool that we're playing in, folks. And not only that, but, the, <laughs> but, but their view of the stuff was very different. I mean, there's a lot of different stories in, in the the two drowning books. And of course, David is trying to link it to wilderness disappearances. And Steph is leaning toward, uh, some kind of, uh, cons uh, more of a conspiratorial human element. Right. So very different, even in the, in the takes on that stuff. And Steph has no problem throwing out every bit of speculation onto her, her books. She takes everyone's ideas and just presents them there for people to decide on their own. Whereas David does the opposite. David doesn't want to, push any idea he's just saying here are the facts look them over maybe someday we can figure this out yep well put all right anything else you think we should address i think that covers a lot of it um and i think that we've said i think we've made ourselves abundantly clear on all this so <laughs> I, I hope so <laughs> hopefully people will uh will 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 under will take our meaning the way we mean it <laughs> I hope so. And and for the record, I very much like David Politis and I very much like Steph Young. And uh yeah, just it there shouldn't be an issue here. 
and I will I will tag that that blog post so people can go check and double check what I've said in this this uh, conversation as much as they can as far as like where stuff was published first, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Thank you, Josh. You're very welcome.